Um, no, that won't work. We're going to try share screen. And share. All right. Do you guys see my screen? Everybody sees the menopause slides. Mm -hmm. Now, hopefully, if I do from the beginning, now it takes up the whole screen and we're good to go. Yes. Okay. And then on it. All right. I'm going to make you guys talk to me, whether you like it or not. Who's all on? Let's see. I see Aaron. I see Kelly. I see Shant. I see Yuri, Molly, Verena. Oh, now you guys are coming. I see Salma. I see Morgan. Okay. Perfect. All right, guys. So um, I think in clinic, menopause is a thing that you guys see probably the least, but those of you that have seen menopause in clinic with me, we kind of have some fun with it. So um, one of the things I was just going to start with is sort of your typical presentation. So you get a 57-year-old female who shows up to the clinic. She's got hot flashes. She's got insomnia. She's got decreased libido for the last one year. Um, Rather than going straight to how you will counsel her, what are some of the things you guys want to ask her when she presents to the office? What are some of the things you want to know in addition to what's on the screen? I don't know if your screen is like fully up. Like, Is it not advancing the slides? No. Ah, I can see the okay. first slide still. Okay. Um... Thank you for telling me that. Okay, now we see it. Now you guys see it. Okay, all right. Then my other screen isn't gonna work. I've got three screens here and they do very interesting things sometimes when I'm presenting. Okay, so 57 year old ask, female. I would also ask her about her mood if she's having issues with depression, um, anxiety, those types of things as well. If she has any sense. other medical conditions, thyroid stuff particularly comes to mind. Just kind of make sure that, you know, I know all of her medical history. I would ask her, you know, what has she tried? I mean, some people have tried some um, like herbal or other alternative um, and complementary medicine options. Great question. Anybody else? When was her last period? Yes, that's what I was waiting for. When was her last period? How long has it been since her last period? Are we let's look at it? seven years or 10 years? Or are we looking at two? Okay. What else? Anything else you guys want to ask her? Or no? Um, ask about other things that could be causing these symptoms, like Kelly said, thyroid disorders, but like signs of malignancy or infection, like TB. I know that stuff is rare, but it can happen. Great point. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you guys this question again at the end. We'll see if your answers change. Um, okay, I always like this one. Um, people are always buying craziness off the internet. That could end badly for somebody. <laughs> I think it's cute. So why do you guys need to know about menopause? because when you get out of here and into the regular world, you will actually see a fair number of menopausal patients. Um, I think what is interesting, or at least what's been interesting about my practice is I think people gravitate towards people that are a similar age range. And so when you are younger in practice, you tend to see a lot of 20, 30, 40 year olds, but Obviously, as you age in your practice, they age in your practice. And so um, I think early on in my practice, I had, you know, some 50 and 60 year olds. But, you know, as you've been doing it for 20 years, then you tend to get a lot more. And so uh, it's at least kind enough to um, give you some time to learn more about menopause. But my goal with this lecture is to give you guys the basics. So if somebody walks into the office, you know what to do. 
So with that, um, greater than a third of a woman's life is spent in menopause. So you will see this whether you like it or not, no matter what uh, you depend on what you decide to do when you guys get into practice. So menopause, average age is 51. Um, it is the permanent cessation of menses resulting in loss of ovarian follicular function, usually due to aging. Um, patients don't necessarily associate the two. Um, most patients think it has to do with the period. They don't relate it to the ovaries in any way, shape or form. The best way to know when somebody's going into menopause is to ask them what their mom, sister uh, went into menopause. Uh, and some people, of course, don't know because that person had a hysterectomy. And so that piece is a little confusing. If you've got a smoker with a low BMI, they're going to go into menopause probably earlier. If you've got a patient with a really high BMI, they tend to go into menopause a little later, uh, but mostly influenced by family history. Um, from a medical standpoint, you guys need to know the diagnosis or the, excuse me, the definitions. Um, our patients call menopause anything around the time of. There's no peri, there's no post for our patients. Menopause is anything from the time they're 40 until the time they're 70. Um, but from a medical perspective, you guys have to differentiate all those different little pieces. So the official definition of menopause, exactly 12 months of amenorrhea with no other pathology. Perimenopause is any time between they start getting menstrual and or endocrine changes and when they actually hit menopause. So 12 months after the final menstrual period. The average age for perimenopause is about 47 and the duration unfortunately is anywhere between four and seven years. And then postmenopausal period is any time once they've hit the diagnosis of menopause, thereafter. And as you can imagine, as people get older, the percent of population in menopause increases. Um, if the patient is under the age of 40 and their periods stop, what's it called? Primary ovarian insufficiency? Premature ovarian failure? Yes, exactly whatever you call it, it is premature. So if she's under the age of 40, menopause isn't normal. And then you need to do a different workup. Okay? Anything after the age of 40 is considered normal menopause, but you still have to diagnose menopause before and rule out some of the other causes before you say, that's it. So physiology, what happens? Um, this part I think is really interesting. So as people get into their 40s, and I mean, you guys know, as you get into your late 30s, even your number of ovarian follicles starts to decrease. As people get into their early to mid 40s, there's further decrease of that ovarian follicular function. And as those follicles function less well, your inhibit B falls, your FSH goes up, and then it becomes this sort of accelerated change. You start getting accelerated follicular development because if you think about the feedback, right, your follicles are responding less well to the FSH. So your body is trying to push more function. So you start getting increased conversion of androgen to estrogen and people get more PMS symptoms. So a lot of times the first sign you'll get of menopause is a patient coming into your office that says, I've got irregular periods and I feel like I'm starting my period all the time. I've got permanent PMS. They're, um, they may be coming in saying their menses are still regular, but they've got permanent PMS. They feel bloated. They feel all of those side effects of that increased conversion of androgen to estrogen. Then once they get into the transition, you get further follicle decrease, so less follicles. The follicles that are left respond poorly to the hormone that's happening, and that's when the ovulation starts to become erratic and they get cycle irregularity. And then at the end, um, when you're in that late menopause transition, you get a real increase in FSH and LH. 
typically most, di most definitions will say your FSH is greater than 25. Your estradiol is low, your progesterone is low, testosterone levels could be all over the map depending, but overall your ratio of estrogen to androgen is decreased. Um, I put this piece in there every year. I think of some things that you guys would want to know. One of the questions I typically get from a patient is, all right, I'm on birth control pills. A lot of us are these days, even into their late 40s. So how am I going to know when I'm in menopause? Well, the answer is, an easy way to check is to check on day seven of the pill-free interval. So she's on a birth control pill pack day seven of her period, go ahead and check an FSH. That's not the most accurate though. So depending on the patient, if she's relatively young, doesn't wanna go off her birth control, you certainly can try that. But a better way would be that she has to actually stop the pill. Patients don't love that option, but if you stop the pill, use a backup method and measure serum FSH about two to four weeks later. So she just has to go off it for a month, not the end of the world. Um, and use a backup, then you'll get a much more accurate serum FSH. If it's greater than 25, then you're pretty guaranteed that she's in menopause. I typically recommend my patients to do that when they hit the age of 50 or 51, as long as they're okay continuing their birth control pills until that time or continuing their Mirena, whatever the case might be. Um, so I, that's going to be one question I think that you guys get asked, and I think that's the easiest way to do it. Take them off of whatever birth control they're on for a month, use a backup, check. If it's greater than 25, they can stop their birth control. The, the chance of pregnancy by then is incredibly low. I think I looked it up once. It's something like one in 100,000. Dr. Kelly, Another if little... have, I'm sorry, if they have like just a progesterone only method, does that it doesn't really change the FSH, is that right? It shouldn't, no. Um, but there's not anything in the literature that I could find that says what it exactly would be. So, I mean, you could certainly check it and see where it is. If it's greater than 25, then I would say you could pull their IUD. Okay unless they're like morbidly obese and it's there for some extra protection anyway. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, I've had patients too who don't wanna go off their birth control pills. And then I've said, all right, we'll check it on day seven, but if it's not 25 and you really wanna know, then we'll go ahead okay. and stop your birth control for a moment. So it's reasonable just to check it, even if they have like an IUD in place and then kind of make decisions based on, okay. Yep, absolutely. All right, then um, clinical effects of menopause. So there are a ton and way too many for me to be able to talk about in this lecture. So I like to concentrate on the top three. Probably 90 plus percent of patients who go through menopause will have one of these three. They may have all of these other things, um, but these are the most common reasons people are coming into your office, irregular periods, hot flashes, sleep issues. So we'll talk about those. So dysfunctional uterine bleeding. It is by far the most common complaint seen in 75% of patients in some way, shape or form, closer together, further apart, um, irregular, lighter, heavier. I mean, it could be anything under the sun. So they come in, they're in that perimenopausal range. First thing you're gonna do, obviously rule out pregnancy. Second most common group for un unintended pregnancies are women in their 40s. Um, uterine pathology, your usual workup, right? You're gonna do your TSH, you're gonna do your CBC, you're gonna look for malignancy, you want an endometrial biopsy, all the, the same things you would do at any other time. Once you've done all of those things and she's got irregular periods and she's in her mid 40s, then you can say, all right, it's perimenopausal changes and then you can treat it but you gotta rule out the bad things first. Vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes is probably the second most common complaint. So what is it? Um, a hot flash is a sudden sensation of heat. It's centered typically on the upper chest and the face. It lasts anywhere between two and four minutes. 
and your skin temperature can actually increase. They've studied it anywhere from one to seven degrees. Of course, not your internal body temperature, that would be bad, but your skin temperature. And then it eventually returns to normal over 30 minutes. If that's happening once a week, no big deal. If it's happening 10 times a day, it can be really, really disturbing for people. Um, and so that's when we start getting those thermostat wars in uh, RCC, et cetera, et cetera, right? You've got layers, layers on, layers off. Um, some people get associated symptoms like heart palpitations, anxiety, massive sweating, where they just break out in a sweat. Um, all of those things are considered normal, but super frustrating depending on how often it's happening. So interestingly enough, only 20 to 30% of women actually get treatment. I think that's so interesting to me. I don't know why you would, I guess people just assume it is a fact and is what it is and they deal with it. Uh, so of those patients, 20 to 30% are gonna show up in your office. Range anywhere from once a day to once an hour. Um, highest occurrence is typically in the first part of perimenopause. So the first couple of years, the episodes peak typically in the evening. Um, it is associated uh, with increased cardiovascular re risk, uh, greater bone loss, increased bone turnover, um, that negative impact on quality of life. So um, during the late reproductive years, some people get um, hot flashes with their menses. Interestingly enough, you've got a little more um, hormonal change around that time. So in the early transition, you'll see about 40% of people have hot, hot flashes, late transition, anywhere to 60 to 80% of people. Here's a nice little probability of vasomotor symptoms. High um, and then low, kind of relatively uh, evenly distributed. So you gotta rule out other causes, just like anything else, right? Rule out malignancy, rule out infection, rule out hyperthyroidism, that might be, be a carcinoid syndrome. Uh, what medicines are they taking? That's always a big one, you never know. Um, and then think about risk factors. So one risk factor, obesity. Anybody um, has, um, it's a, that theoretical piece is interesting. So um, obese patients are more likely to have hot flashes. Um, theoretically, you would think the higher serum estrone concentrations and increased peripheral conversion of androstenedione dione in adipose tissue means less, but um, weight loss can help reduce hot flashes. So like anything else, exercise might improve it, might improve their sleep too. Um, they've done some studies on socioeconomic factors, less than high school education, low socioeconomic status, higher uh, association with hot flashes. Triggers could be all kinds of different things, but the most common, uh, stress, caffeine, alcohol, spicy food, warm environments. Uh, 10 to 15% of women have very severe hot flashes. Um, there's some data that says if you had severe PMS symptoms early on in life, you might have more hot flashes. Um, and it affects African-Americans greater than Hispanics, greater than Caucasians, greater than Asians. So least amount of um, hot flashes in Asians. Uh, depending on the study you look at, duration, um, mean duration of hot flash uh, periods, 4.9 years. Um, a third of patients have hot flashes for 10 years. Um, and 8% of women have hot flashes for greater than 20. Uh, in the SWAN study, Median 4.5, longest duration 11.8. Um, African Americans were the longest uh, versus uh, Asian and Hispanics were the shortest at five years. All right, vasomotor pathophysiology. So it's th thermoregulatory dysfunction. It's happening at the level of the hypothalamus, caused by estrogen withdrawal. And it has to do with the uh, narrowing of the thermoneutral zone. So our internal mechanisms to dissipate heat then are initiated at lower increases in temperature. So you just become less tolerant to temperature fluctuations. Sleep. Um, hot flashes account for about 27% of night wakefulness. Uh, difficulty sleeping is noticed in about 32 to 40% in early menopause, 38 to 46% late menopause. 
Hot flashes tend to be most common in the first four hours of sleep, but patients will come in talking about difficulty falling asleep, premature awakenings, difficulty resuming sleep, um, and overall proven decreased REM sleep. Uh, REM sleep actually suppresses hot flashes, arousals, and awakenings. Obviously, there's your typical management of sleep disorders, uh, behavioral type things, avoiding things that we know cause um, sleep issues, alcohol, ca caffeine, nicotine, routines, um, avoid disturbances, distractions, weight management, exercise. There's all kinds of non-prescription um, sleep treatments, um, most common being typically melatonin. And then you guys know what all the prescriptions are for sleep. I added this one in here on vaginal atrophy because I think that's one that confuses people a lot as well. Um, so initial therapy for vaginal atrophy would be either vaginal moisturizers or lubricants, depending on what the patient is complaining of. The difference, vaginal moisturizers are intended to be used routinely, two to three days a week, and not just for intercourse. So I gave you guys some examples of what those vaginal moisturizers would be, most of them over the counter, some you can order online. Vaginal lubricants, different, are intended to be used at the time of sexual activity. So if they've got vaginal dryness at the time of sexual activity, that's when you'd want to use those. It's really about trial and error um, and finding the best one that works for the patient. So if they try a couple, tell them not to be discouraged, keep trying until they find one that works. Uh, vaginal lubricants, there's water-based, silicone-based, oil-based. Um, uh, the data suggests that they can be as effective as vaginal estrogen, um, but most of the data is lim limited by sample size and duration of follow-up. So uh, if you're looking for a study, that may, might be an interesting one. If they have persistent symptoms, then your best bet is estrogen. All right, menopausal therapy. Um, I always throw this in there because menopause is one of those things where there is a huge placebo effect, 20 to 50% placebo effect for hot flashes. Um, women with higher anxiety scores can be more likely to respond to hot flashes. I find that kind of interesting. Um, and even statistically significant effective agents may act at least partially through some sort of placebo uh, mechanism. So you've really got to look at those randomized controlled trials. Um, treatment options, um, lifestyle modification for a lot of these, estrogen, um, prescription alternatives, and then there are of course the non-prescription alternatives. So I want to talk about all of those briefly. Lifestyle modifications, keeping your core temperature cool, um, yoga, meditation, exercise. If they're smoker, stop smoking. Um, lower the room temperature, dress in layers. All of those things can be successful depending on the patient. But um, estrogen is truly the best treatment if there are no contraindications for all things menopausal. Estrogen will fix irregular periods. It will uh, fix hot flashes. It will fix vaginal atrophy. It's really a question of whether your patient wants to go that route. Um, so then you've got to first figure out what their risks are. Are they a candidate or not? Then you've got to talk about the differences, type, dose, route, all that jazz. So we got to talk about the estrogen question. I feel like this is the thing that kills you guys. Uh, when you're thinking about prescribing uh, estrogen for menopause is risk factors. So you got to know the results of the Women's Health Initiative. So Women's Health Initiative, super interesting study that literally changed the course of menopausal management back in 2002. So back in 2002, I was in the middle of my residency and I um, the study came out and immediately every single woman on the planet called her gynecologist. <laughs> so um, fun time to be a GYN. Uh, and I would say every family member called her family member a gynecologist. So there were a lot of phone calls happening. I feel like I talked to every aunt uh, within that month um, about their HRT. Um, prior to the WHI, we thought estrogen was the fountain of youth. Every postmenopausal woman was offered estrogen 
And if she wanted to go on it, she got it. End of story. So I would venture to say 75% of postmenopausal women were on estrogen in some way, shape, or form. So what is it? What do you need to know? The WHI was a nine-year study. It was actually scheduled to end in 2005. They ended it early in 2002. What's interesting about WHI is it wasn't ever designed to evaluate estrogen and hot flashes. It was designed to evaluate estrogen and risk of cardiovascular events. So there were actually three arms of the study, a placebo, an estrogen only, and then an estrogen and progestin. But look at the participants of this study. This is the interesting piece. The participants were average age 63, already at an increased risk of cardiovascular events based on their age. 50% of those patients were current or past smokers, also at a risk factor for cardiovascular events. 50% of the patients were greater than age 60, and they actually excluded women uh, that had hot flashes. That was not the purpose of the study. So the results of this study then got plastered on everything else, maybe inappropriately. So conclusions for arm one. So arm one, arm one was the combined arm. Um, it was um, estrogen and progestin, increased risk of breast cancer. However, larger primary cancers and more positive lymph nodes. Increased risk of stroke, we know that, courtesy of the estrogen. Increased risk of cardiovascular disease, six per 10,000 patient person years. Increased risk of VTE, again, estrogen, PE and DVT, 18 per 10,000 person years. Average follow-up for the study, 5.2 years, and a reduction in risk of fractures and colon cancer. Fractures, again, makes sense, estrogen. But look at the conclusions for ARM2. In ARM2, there was an insignificantly decreased breast cancer risk. So if you've got a patient and you're putting them on estrogen, only no progestin, you are not increasing the risk of breast cancer. Important to know. Estrogen plus progestin equals an increased risk of breast cancer. So what else from this estrogen only arm? Increased risk of stroke, again, no change in cardiovascular effects, increased risk of VTE, expected, right? Um, but significant for DVT, not PE, reduction in fracture risk, no difference in colorectal cancer. I think the fracture risk was expected, again, estrogen, estrogen, estrogen. So what's the bottom line? What do you need to tell your patient? If you're putting your patient on combined hormonal therapy, there is an increased likelihood of abnormal mammograms because there's increased mammographic density, 6% at a year. So higher likelihood that they're gonna get a false positive recall and have to go repeat it. But for this increased risk of breast cancer, that is 2.3% for each use by year, it doesn't happen until year three if they've been on HRT before, it doesn't happen until year four if they've got no prior use. So that means that you can put somebody on HRT for a short period of time for symptom release and, can you say that? Symptom, not release, symptom, yeah, you guys know what I'm saying. Really, you're good. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a long week. Um, and her absolute risk of breast cancer is eight cases per 10,000 person years. At 5.2 years, no increased risk until she hits year four, because most of your patients have never been on HRT before. Questions? That's the bottom line. That's what your patient wants to know cardiovascular risk, and breast cancer risk. And if you memorize this slide, you can prescribe HRT. Done. Okay, going to the next slide. So what do you need to know about estrogen? It should be administered continuously. Younger women may need some higher doses, especially surgical menopause, up to 0.1 milligrams for the first two to three years after surgery. 
lower doses have less vaginal bleeding, breast tenderness, makes sense, right? Less estrogenetic side effects, lower risk of stroke, VTE, et cetera. What are your side effects? Typical side effects for estrogen, breast tenderness, mood changes, bloating, um, bleeding, and we'll talk about um, almost always seen with cyclic progestins. What are your types of estrogen? Topical. Um, if they've got diabetes or liver disease, great, because there's less first pass effect or less first uh, pass effect on the liver, um, less effect on the serum lipids. Um, topical works really well for hot flashes. Oral is probably the most common and the cheapest, um, but it's got greater side effects on the liver. Vaginal, um, there's no evidence that links the use of low dose vaginal estrogen. We'll talk about that with heart disease, stroke, or cancer. Um, transdermal, uh, again, no first pass effect. So better for diabetes or liver disease, less effect on serum lipids, great for hot flashes. Does transdermal have decreased chance of VTE? Probably, um, I but- like Somebody said something like that the other day. Yes. Um, I mean, the answer is you're going to get lower serum levels of estrogen. So the actual answer is yes. The question is at what dose? Um, and they've done some studies on that for vaginal estrogen. There are fewer studies for the transdermal. What's interesting is if you look at the FDA black box warning, FDA says, all formulas carry the same risk. So you're going to get a black box warning and you're going to have to explain that to your patient one way or the other. So most common oral estrogens, I threw some of the basics on there. We typically start at a lower dose, move up to a higher dose, estrace, menest, uh, orthoest, um, premarin. Those are usually the most common ones you're going to end up using. Uh, vaginal estrogens, the most common, uh, Premarin and estrace. So I threw those on there as well, along with the manufacturing recommendations. So doses for Premarin, 0.5 to 2 grams of cream. Um, if you look at the um, regimen from the manufacturer, it says uh, continuous twice weekly or cyclic daily for 21 days and off for seven days. Most people do a, a maintenance dose of twice a week. They don't do this cyclic regimen. Estradiol, the uh, manufacturer's recommendations actually talk about tapering up, or, or sorry, tapering down. So if you've got a patient that's coming in, and it makes sense, right, with significant vaginal atrophy symptoms, makes sense to use it maybe Q day for the first couple of weeks, then go down from there Till you get to a maintenance dose and your maintenance dose would be one gram of cream one to three times a week. Um, what has been interesting for me is neither Permarin nor um, Estrace cream are covered by Medicare. Um, so super frustrating uh, for your patients um, who are elderly with vaginal atrophy, trying to get it covered is a nightmare. Um, bioidentical hormones. You are going to get questions about these. So the reality, the reality is a bioidentical hormone is anything that is made in a custom compounded pharmacy. What your patients think is that it's somehow this magic exact duplication of natural hormones that are produced in the ovaries. No, it's still synthetic. It's just not FDA approved. So in those uh, custom compounded recipes, they typically throw an estrogen and or a progestin and or a testosterone. There are no randomized trials that uh, demonstrate efficacy or safety. Um, if you go on all the websites, they offer salivary and blood testing of hormone levels and somehow have created this um, table that then says, oh, well, if your salivary or your blood testing is X, then your custom compounded version should be Y. Scientifically, doesn't make sense. You've got irregular hormones happening in perimenopause. Those hormone levels change hour by hour, day by day. They fluctuate over time. There's no way to miraculously mimic what your body would be making otherwise. 
Um, and then I just threw this in there in one study, potencies ranged anywhere from 67.5 to 268% of the amount specified on the label. Scary stuff. So your job is then to explain to your patient why she should be having uh, FDA approved chemicals in her body as opposed to the non FDA approved chemicals. So what does the North American Menopause Society say? Uh, they've um, and the Endocrine Society, they've all issued statements advising against the use of custom compounded hormones. Contents, dose, quality, and sterility are not subject to regulatory oversight. Uh, they're not required to put any package inserts. So your patients somehow think this isn't the same estrogen that is the FDA approved version and therefore is safer. Um, if your patient really wants a natural estrogen, there are FDA approved estrogens that come from soy and yams versus Premarin, which actually comes from pregnant mare urine. That's where they came up with the Premarin um, in the lab. So if your patient has a problem with that, great, soy yams right here, give these guys a try. If she's young, so if she's coming in and she's complaining to you about hot flashes, but she's still menstruating, use OCPs. Great answer. Um, typically a 20 microgram pill will provide some hot flash or symptom relief. If not, go up to a 30 microgram pill. As long as she's not got any risk factors for OCPs, it's a great answer. Um, obviously you would avoid it in obese women, greater risk for VTE. Um, and basically you can keep them on contraception all the way until they go through menopause. Pregnancy rates, again, less than 1% after age 50, that gets back to our initial conversation about when you start testing and taking them off their OCPs. Questions? All right, I'm gonna keep going. Cessation of therapy. So when do you stop them once you've got them on this? Typically 40 to 50% of patients stop themselves within the first year. Great, nothing for you to do. Once you've basically met with them, talked about risks and benefits, you start them on their HRT, see them back for a couple of monitoring visits. Usually I see them back a month after I start, check and have them keep a little um, uh, notebook of their hot flash symptoms. Um, 65 to 75% stop within two years. Um, if they stop abruptly, you'll wanna warn them, uh, they probably are gonna get their hot flashes back at least temporarily. If they taper it, a little better. So typically when I do take somebody off or I plan to take somebody off, I taper. Um, and a nice slow taper means um, slightly less uh, vasomotor side effects. Although 55% are gonna get some kind anyway. Next study that came out after the WHI study was a HOPE study, low dose hormone alternatives. Basically what they found in the HOPE study was if you use HRT, lower dose, shortest period of time, you get better bleeding, you get same hip and spine fracture prevention, same hot flash prevention, same effect on vaginal dryness. So start at a lower dose, no big deal. Then the uterus. There we go. So if she's got a uterus, she's got a risk of hyperplasia. The absolute risk for endometrial carcinoma in a postmenopausal patient is one in a thousand. If you give her estrogen, you bump that up to one in a hundred, unless you give her progestin. That risk is duration and dose dependent. It can happen in as little as six months, but if you give her the progestin, that all goes away. Completely and totally irrelevant as long as you give the progestin. So what do you do? Give it to all patients that have a uterus. You can give it continuously or cyclically. 60 to 75%, if you give it continuously, will get amenorrhea after six months. Um, there is some data now that says, if you're giving a very low dose of vaginal estrogen cream to a patient with vaginal atrophy, just to treat the atrophy, that it creates a serum level that is low enough that you probably don't need a progestin. So if you're using the low dose ring, the S-ring, 
or the lowest doses of Vagifem or Imvexi two to four times a week, you can probably get away without it. You should still talk about risk with the patient. If you're using max doses, then you get levels that could be equivalent to serum levels of orals. And then you should be using a progestin. You shouldn't be putting them on a solo estrogen. So what are your choices for progesterone? There is Provera, five to 10 milligrams a day, cyclic for 10 to 12 days, or continuous 2.5 or five milligrams a day. Your alternate option is Prometrium, a little less vaginal bleeding, a little less side effects on your lipids. So most people use Prometrium. If you're gonna do it cyclically, 200 milligrams per day for 12 days on, the others off, or one to 200 per day continuous. So this is what I usually do is the Prometrium 100 to 200 continuous. There are some studies out there, um, particularly in Europe, about um, a Mirena IUD as your progesterone source, um, but it hasn't been demonstrated yet. Um, and then there was this questionable increased risk of breast cancer. And drosperinone is only in Europe. It's not here. Um, obviously, you still want to do monitoring, right? If she's got any changes in her bleeding, I mean, you can follow it for the first six months. You would expect when you start a new hormone for the first six months, she will have some sort of bleeding changes. But if she's still having metarrhagia after six months of being on this, then you've got to do a typical workup. You've got to do your usual endometrial biopsy, ultrasound monitoring, whichever route you choose, especially for any bleeding after amenorrhea. Um, and you guys all know ultrasound monitoring and biopsy uh, for anybody who is greater than five millimeters. Um, so Dr. Kelly, yes. uh, usually that low dose like vaginal um, estrogen mm -hmm. is not going to help very much for the hot flashes. It's more for vaginal atrophy. You usually need it for, you usually need higher doses of Correct. vaginal estrogen. So to treat, um, hot flashes. And so you would need most likely some progesterone for those patients. Correct. I would say the one time that you're going to use that low dose, um, a vaginal issue is going to be like in your little old 80 year old lady who still has a uterus, but you don't want to put her on any more medicine than you absolutely have to. You give her the, that little tiny bit of vaginal estrogen. Um, if you've got a patient that's got hot flashes, you're typically going to go with either an oral or a transdermal estrogen or a topical. You typically aren't going to treat your hot flashes with a vaginal. You'd have to go at really high doses to get symptom relief, and you're going to be better off going with your oral or your transdermal. Great question. Any other questions? There's a... Um... It's the, the fem ring, right? That's a higher dose that can be good for atrophy and hot flashes. Yes. But that's like one that if you use it, you use it for a longer period of time, you actually have to do like ultrasound surveillance and stuff if they have. A... Okay. Correct. Have you used that much? I have not. I bet it's expensive. I think what's been interesting for me, I mean, there's so many different kinds of, I mean, creams and gels and I mean, all these different things out there, they are incredibly expensive, um, typically not covered by insurance. I mean, you end up using the bare bones basics, Premarin. They add or a basic patch. Um, Nam's recommendations, oh, go ahead. Cost-wise for um, like PremPro, is that pretty expensive too? It's not bad. Okay. That one you might be able to get covered if she's got um, insurance. Okay. Um, NAMS recommendations post WHI, um, use your HRT, but for the shortest period of time with the lowest dose. And then you've got to reevaluate yearly. So once I start somebody on something, I bring her back in about a month check with her, see how it's working, maybe bring her back in another month. But if it's working, then you're gonna leave her on it. And then when she comes back for her annual exam, I re-document the conversation about HRT and the side effects. 
again, risks versus benefits, right? As long as you're documenting that you talk to her about risk versus benefits, even if she's seven years and she's still on HRT, then I just document. Patient is aware, 2.3% per year based on this study, this year, she's two years past it, she's three years past it, she is aware, she's choosing to continue to take her HRT. Any other questions? I just have a comment. Um, I know that yeah. NAM, NAMS has a really nice um, like position statement, long article, uh, just paper about all of this that I like constantly refer to, so. They actually, if you guys ever wanna do some additional sort of education, have a great conference um, and you can get menopause certified through NAMS. They put out a booklet once every couple of years, they update it solely on menopause and treatment of menopause. It's good stuff. Any other questions, comments? I'm, I'm looking at my notes from Spiroff and stuff and I'm, I'm thinking about like the progesterone thing. And if you said this, I apologize. But um, so talking about like the side effects of progesterone and like, cause you know, people can get breast pain and um, bloating and depression and different things like that. Um, they talked about, you, you mentioned it, doing like the 14 day course instead of continuously, but that that mm -hmm. provides less protection. Um, do you do that ever? So I would say based on menopause, it should provide you if you're giving it cyclically, let's go back to that yep. slide here. I think you here said it causes more irregular bleeding. Not right. So you get the same endometrial protection, but you get more irregular bleeding and or regular bleeding, right? If you're giving right, right. her back her estrogen, but you're giving her cyclic progesterone, she's more likely to have bleeding. Now, some yeah. patients might like that, right? If she, um, people are funny. I don't know why anybody would like a period personally, but some people feel better about it. So some people want cyclic progesterone. But as long as you're giving it per these dosages, Molly, then mm -hmm. you get your endometrial protection, mm -hmm. even with that cyclic version. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll have to look at Spiroff again, because I just have it in my notes that they talk about, like, maybe doesn't match the protection offered by daily treatment. So I'll, oh, I'll look okay. at But it might be the difference, like you're saying, between this 200 versus 100 milligrams. Right. There definitely I, is a difference in dosage, right? So if you're giving cyclic, all the menopausal studies say for prometrium, you've got to give 200 versus 100. For daily. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I talked about it with Dr. Shanti a fair amount. I remember asking her and she prefers, like you said, the prometrium 100 milligrams a day is like mm -hmm. what, she would, what she would do. That's exactly what I do. Okay. 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 All right. Emerging treatments all these t sex So uh, FDA approved for the treatment of vasomotor symptoms and osteoporosis prevention. Um, it has a potential indication for uh, women with moderate to severe hot flashes or breast tenderness. Um, I haven't used a ton of it. Um, Basodoxyphene is a combination of a serum and an estrogen. So new stuff coming out. Um, I don't have any great anecdotal evidence for you guys on that. So um, I like to give you a little bit at the end about alternatives. So when a patient comes into my office and she's got hot flashes, for example, I'm gonna talk about estrogen, I'm gonna talk about prescription alternatives, and I'm gonna talk about non-prescription alternatives. So if you won't take estrogen, what are your choices? There are lots of studies that have been done about treatment of hot flashes with other things. SSRIs and SNRIs, good um, data on alternate, alternatives uh, for hot flashes. Progestins, you could just give them progestin, but high doses of progestin, as Molly was just talking about, then you start getting into your side effects, right? Bloating, hot flashes, um, or sorry, bloating, um, breast tenderness, those sorts of things. So you can do uh, norethindrone acetate or you can do megase. 
Megase in high doses, some people say reduces hot flashes by uh, 85% in one study. Uh, clonidine, if she's got high blood pressure and she's got hot flashes, sometimes I talk to the PCP about switching her over to clonidine for hypertension because um, you can get a duplicate um, bonus there. Um, and lastly, gabapentin, 31 to 46% reduction in some studies. Um, a single dose QHS if she's got nighttime stuff. Um, so you do have alternatives if she can't or won't take estrogen. Non-prescription alternatives. So that's where you start getting into dicey data, but there are some small short-term trials. So black cohosh, two to 20 milligram tabs per day, some possible estrogenic side effects on the breast, but so far nobody's proven um, increased risk of um, breast cancer. Nausea, dizziness, if she um, takes it for longer periods of time, so you wanna do it for short term, um, the trials are conflicting. Some small short-term trials suggested benefits. Um, there's some systematic reviews and meta-analyses that say no more effective than placebo. Um, again, a lot of the stuff has a placebo effect, so that's where it gets tough. Soy, um, estrogenic and anti-estrogenic side effects. Um, you gotta take a, a ton of soy to get hot flash benefit. Um, and unfortunately, a ton of soy gives you GI side effects. So then you end up with diarrhea, flatulence, bloating, um, but you might have less hot flashes, risk versus benefits. Um, each food is different in the amount of absorption. So again, you've got to look at what, what the amount of soy is in the food that they're eating. 160 milligrams or 25 grams of soy protein um, may reduce the risk of heart disease, no good studies on bone density, also an option. Valerian root. Uh, valerian root either comes in a pill or a tea form. Uh, people have also used it to treat insomnia. Um, so it might be good if she's got hot flashes at night or night sweats. Um, it's a mild tranquilizer. Um, but side effects of headaches, so watching your migraine patients, uh, and restlessness with long-term use. Um, some interesting studies uh, on cognitive behavioral therapy for menopause-associated insomnia. Um, not as effective for hot flashes. Lots of frequent in-person visits, so people are making money off of it. Um, there were two randomized controlled trials, uh, significant reduction of bother, but no actual reduction in hot flash, flash frequency. So people were less bothered by their hot flashes, but they still had them. Uh, hypnosis might be of benefit, data is limited. Stellate ganglion blocks, some people are doing pilot trials. Interesting. And um, a couple of things with some real questionable efficacy. Evening primrose oil, you'll hear people talk about a lot, acupuncture, flaxseed. Again, all of the studies are really conflicting. No great randomized controlled trials that have proven benefit. All right, so your take homes. It affects all women differently. Um, make sure you talk about alternatives, see what she wants to do. Um, I generally find if you talk to your patient about those three different options, prescription alternatives, non-prescription alternatives, and estrogen, and you let her choose whatever she does choose, she'll be happier with. And honestly, if she chooses, for example, to do soy, but you've talked to her about the other options. Well, when she comes back in a month, if she says the soy isn't working, then you go down to the next option that she's willing to try. Why not? Um, so back to our initial question, how will you counsel the patient? So anything you guys would change from your initial assessment, you'd ask the same questions, but thoughts? Do you guys feel like you can treat a patient that's coming into the office if she's 57, she's talking about half lashes? I made a smart phrase. It's YZHRT, copy and edit. Nice. I think I have one too. Um, a U W M G counseling menopause. Ooh. I feel like I always have to refer back to my, 
my notes before I see these patients, but when I remember, I'll, I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, right. Well, and I think truly, I still do too. I know, for example, if she wants to go with a non-prescription alternative that I can do clonidine, I can do gabapentin, I can do SSRIs and SNRIs, but I never remember what the um, dosing is for treatment of hot flashes. So then I go back and I look. And paroxetine is the only FDA approved one. Correct. Just because it was studied for specifically for that, but it doesn't mean the others don't work. Right. You are very correct. All right, any questions? Hopefully guys, this was helpful. I'll go ahead and send Robin or well, I'll just send it all to you guys. I think I still have my um, uh, listserv for you guys. I'll just send it out to all of you and feel free to take it, do with it what you will. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks okay. guys, happy Thanks, Friday. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. good to see you. <laughs> good to see you oh, too. Can you um, upload it to our drive please, the lecture? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Oh, you said you were going to email it? I'm sorry. Email it and we can do it. And we'll upload it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Yeah. You were like, oh, God, no. <laughs> Thank you. All, All right, guys. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. You too.